This is Remote Ruby. Have you any remote idea to the meaning of the word? What's up? Yo. What's up? So I'm just going to start off by, I checked the Remote Ruby Twitter today. I mean, if I'm the one that runs it. Someone tweeted, waiting for the next Remote Ruby to drop. And the <laughs> gif of the Narcos Pablo Escobar just like in deep in thought. And I was like, oh no. And the only thing I could think about, I tweeted about it, was that literally a week ago we stood on stage and said, make sure you publish every week consistently and on time. And then the literal next week, it was like... Oh, we missed a week? Yeah, we didn't miss a week. Paul sent us <laughs> Steve's three-peat episode while we were at RailsConf, and we were so excited to send him back the picture of him that we never actually published the episode. Oh. <laughs> I was very yeah. excited for him to get that picture, though. I will normally, like, see that email and then, like, download it immediately and upload it, but... yeah. Sending that picture back, I'm pretty sure I hit send an archive and then it was gone. Chris, he's our most reliable one about making sure every week it gets uploaded. So it's not Chris's fault it didn't get uploaded. It's really Andrew and I's fault for always putting that responsibility on Chris. Whoa, 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 whoa. I think, well, uh, it's, stop, it's your fault. stop right now. <laughs> stop right now. It's your fault. Hold on. <laughs> if y'all want me to upload the episodes, that is information I need to know beforehand. It's on me. Okay. I can I, what I'm trying to do is checking. I'm not, I'm trying to make sure the blame doesn't go to Chris as the one who usually uploads the episode. I blame you, Chris. I'm just kidding. Yes, we have responsibility as co heirs of Remote Ruby to make sure I that when we just... say an episode will get published, it gets published. As soon as this episode started, I was like, wait, I didn't listen to Steve's episode yet. And I guess that's why <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even put it together. Like all of our advice, do as we say, not as we do. Uh, yeah. I mean, to be fair, our talk was like, here's a bunch of mistakes we've made. Last Paul, you're time, not a mistake. Paul, oh my God. Paul is the only reason this thing became sustainable. <laughs> For real. Seriously. It really is. I'll tell the story I told in an Uber. One of the slides I wanted to make. <laughs> is about, the in an Uber, like important context? Well, you were there. <laughs> I think you were there. Maybe you weren't. I wanted to put a picture of me with my parents because I have this sweet picture from like 2007, I had a goatee because I couldn't grow a full beard yet. And it was a church picture with my parents. And I wanted to put it on the slide and be like, this is mom and dad. Whenever mom and dad tell me something, I respect it. Whenever mom and dad give me praise, it means a lot to me. And then I wanted to put Paul's face in between mom and dad and be like, this is Paul. Oh, yeah. And whenever he gives me praise, <laughs> True. <it> means, <laughs> and whenever he gives me advice, I heed it. I think we'll get to see him in next RailsConf. Oh, yeah. I didn't realize they were in Atlanta because it kind of makes me just want to hop down to Atlanta and go see Paul. Like, no other reason to go to Atlanta. But Do it. We can you smuggle want. him into the conference. We could. If we're going to do another podcast panel, like, he needs to be there Jeez. for that one for sure. And he can live edit it. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> He's going to need a bleep button. Let's yeah. Do it, Andrew. He's just got to yell, bleep. <laughs> yeah. We can talk about this more on another episode because we have Steve back. If you listened to the episode that dropped late, Steve, Lito, we didn't finish our conversation, so we invited him back, which we can get into. But there was a lot about RailsConf we could talk about because all three of us were there. And I think that's the first time the three of us have been together in the same physical location since we started podcasts. Like, since I met y'all. Yeah. Yeah. I was Crazy. telling someone earlier, though, I was trying to be like, RailsConf is only the like, second time I've hung out with Andrew. And then I was like, except for the retreat a month earlier, except for Sin City Ruby a month before that. Why are you talking about me, bro? Because I have this bad habit where I'm really like glad to be friends with you. And so I tell people about it. You're the only one that says that. I know. <laughs> I realized. Described as a mistake before. <laughs> I thought you were saying that you talk shit about our relationship. No, no, I was saying... You're, you're the only you're, one that says it's a friendship. No, no, I'm saying you're the only one that says it's a good friendship. You keep me young. You teach me phrases. Steve, let's talk about these geriatric millennials for a quick second. Sweet God. When I <laughs> oh, hear I, the term geriatric, it's like decrepit. Yes. How old do you think I am, Andrew? I just kind of... <laughs> because this is... This is look this could, my age. So I'm assuming now that you've said that, that you're like, 
very early 30s. There's no way you're over 30, dude. 32. Oh, my God. I Because I, I truly believe if I had to guess, I would have said 28. When we talked about this earlier, I have the physique of a jockey. I look much younger than I am. But no, I'm 32. It's a good age, though. I'm digging it. Dude, you're rocking it. <laughs> Chris used to be 32. Yeah, like yeah. a long time ago. Like a two, nice 20 hours ago. Hours ago. <laughs> I can retire now, right? I hit that age, I think. 33? Yeah, can't retirement age. Too. 33. What's it like being Not, 33? Oh, it sucks. What's it like? Does it? <laughs> Crap. I had a feeling. <laughs> yeah. The second it switches, everything changes. <laughs> oh. You're nice. looking forward to it, Jason? Yeah. 33 in three days. Wait, y'all are the same age? Yeah. We're five. Not right apart. now. Yeah. <laughs> For three days of the was, year, we are. Jason's beard always made me think he was like, Eight years older than me. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Stop. Jason, you're 32? <laughs> yeah. Cool. The brain broke. The fact that we're both 32 is really boggling. Hold on, hold on. What age did you think I was? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to backpedal. Hold on. <laughs> okay, not that you look a certain... I just thought you were older than Chris. I thought you were 38. But you have kids, dude. Everyone with kids is 40 in my brain. Okay, that's fine. If you have kids, you yeah. are 40 to me. Does that mean you actually <laughs> thought I was a boomer? It wasn't like a, like a satire thing? It was satire because, dude, you'd have to be like way older to be a boomer. Yeah, I'm only 32. I was born in 89. May 30th, 1989. Got some reflection to do today. That's why Chris and I gel so well is because we're, we're only days apart. But I am clearly much older and wiser. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> five days older. I don't want to five days my wiser. Beard back out because you're going to think I'm like 60. Yeah. Well, dude, you're just like an adult to me. When I think of Jason, I think Jason <laughs> is an adult. He thinks sure, you ordered yes, off the senior very, menu at like, Denny's. Yes. yes. He but was not because of that. I pulled out my AARP card the other day. <laughs> I, well, yeah, but, but y'all get those at 30, right? Yeah. When you said you feel like I'm an adult is my, you're the only one who thinks that. So we're even. In crisis, I look to you as the adult to do something. Oh, sweet. All right. Cool, 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 cool. Is that why it hurts so bad that I keep talking shit about you not having a house? Yeah, I'm like, dad is upset. <laughs> dad doesn't approve. Oh, no. Uh, not the disapproval trauma. <laughs> anyway. Sorry, Steve. This is what I came here for. <laughs> I appreciate this. We spent a whole week together, and then we haven't really all talked together in a week, so it's it's been a hard dynamic. I know. It's been hard for me. Talked about in therapy. J Jason withdrawal, yeah, I got that. That's why I get so depressed after conferences. Same. So I want to start by saying that at the last episode, which is called Steve 3 Pete Polito, I think this one now technically classifies as Steve 4 Pete Polito. Yeah. Yeah. Even right, though he's 32 years old. Third in parentheses, 32 years old. It's arguably a continuation of our earlier conversation, but we did record it all at once. It has literally been two weeks since we recorded. Therefore, I think it officially crosses the line into a fresh episode, which means I believe you hold the award for most guest appearances as 100% undisputed champion of Remote Ruby. That's high honor. Very much appreciated. I'm going to take a screenshot of this and put it on my fridge. After the episode. <laughs> oh, I got to focus. All right, Steve, number one, thanks for being back again. Number two, when we left off last time, we wanted to talk about, because before, if I'm not mistaken, you were working on a product, right? You were part of the team that was building something. Yep. And now you're working at ThoughtBot, which arguably like still works on products, but you're not working on ThoughtBot's product. You're like a consultant, like you're working on behalf of ThoughtBot, helping other people to build products, right? Just exactly. Good. So I think it's fascinating. And I think Chris probably has some insight on this as well. Okay, Chris is, Chris is giving us the note. Chris is out today. <laughs> we needed some of that 33-year-old wisdom. I'm interested to talk about it because they are kind of two different games, in my opinion, like two different playing fields. I've not done professional Rails consulting, but I've done enough side consulting, like building web 
that I know it comes with a set of challenges or a set of differences that like building a product comes with. So I kind of wanted to talk about that. So maybe first, where you were before ThoughtBot, would you mind maybe explaining kind of like what you were doing there and what that was like? So before ThoughtBot, I was at Impact Branding and Design. And they're a marketing agency. They do a lot of work with HubSpot, but also coaching folks on how to do the things that Impact does. And they wanted a way to kind of scale that. So they they wanted to make a digital platform for that. Kind of like a cross between like LinkedIn and Udemy, but specifically for Impact. And I was fortunate enough to get a job there. That was the only thing that we were working on. That was their product. And so, you know, honestly, that was really good experience though for ThoughtBot because it was everyone's first time working on a product to some degree. So we had a lot of opportunities to try things out and change them. But it's like from a, not so much a tech stack, but we had the freedom to try things out when we were building out new features. There was one time where I was like really fascinated with Alpine. So it was just like, I'll use this as an, uh, an opportunity to learn Alpine while I'm building out this particular feature. But there's also opportunities to adjust our workflow and kind of figure out how we want to do like syncs and if we're going to do retros and how are we going to communicate? Are we going to be asynchronous? Are we going to be in meetings more often? That was my experience there. It was a little challenging though, because that was my first Rails job, my first professional Rails job. And it was also my first time working for a product because the job before that, I was working on an agency doing WordPress work. So in some ways it's consulting. It's just a little easier to scope because WordPress is in terms of software, it's not as complicated as building your own software. But now at ThoughtBop, it's an agency, but we're, you know, we're all consultants and we're helping people build their product or maintain it. But we're also trying to get them to a point where they can graduate, so to speak, and we could kind of hand off the project to them and when the time is right. And hopefully we will have given them two things. We've given them the software that they need, but we have also given them the tools, like the soft skill tools and framework to know how to like hire the right people and how to run syncs and retros. So the biggest difference between my previous job and this job is there's a level of separation between us and the product. At some point, I will not be working on this project at some point. And that's assumed. But that being said, we work very closely with the client. Like they meet with us in the syncs and the retros. So honestly, my perspective of it is I kind of work for this company. That's how it feels like, which is good. That way, communication is clear and you feel like you're on the same team. But the biggest difference is people do roll on and off. Now, I've been on this project for six months ever since I started, which I like that a lot. It's been a a fun project of learning a lot, but people roll on and off. So the challenge there is you want to set up a good foundation for people to join. So it doesn't take them like three weeks to get up and running. It'll still take time, but the goal is you want to make it easy for folks to roll on and off. One thing you said about when you were at Impact that was fascinating too is that it wasn't necessarily that you were just building a product. Sounds like you were defining how the team works. Like you're talking about, you're figuring out how you're going to communicate, how often you're going to meet, stuff like that. So when you're doing that, like I assume at Impact, it's with, at a minimum, the other devs, but maybe like stakeholders. What is that like when you're get ThoughtBot? Are you meeting with, you said you meet with the clients that come to your stuff, but is that also like, bosses and stuff at ThoughtBot, what does that look like? Yeah, so the project I'm on, it's really well set up. Again, this is the only project I've worked on, so I don't have anything to compare it with. We have someone who is the product manager and they do work for ThoughtBot. So it's great for me as a developer because they take care of working with the stakeholders to work on the product roadmap and carve out tickets to work on things like that. So it's great because at Impact, That was not my job. I I wasn't the product manager, but I worked very closely with him and I would sort of be involved with the roadmap as well. And which was very good experience because even though my passion is development, obviously if it were up to me, I would spend probably way more time trying to code like the perfect thing versus just getting something out the door, moving on to the next thing and having it validated. And it's also important to understand it, it was good experience for me too, because then I could understand where the stakeholders are coming from. Because at the end of the day, if the product isn't making any money, that's not good. So that means a lot of different things, you know, per project. But 
that's always something I kind of check myself against too. The challenge there though is just, okay, well, how do you deal with deadlines then? Because it's not possible to do everything in a week if you try to work a sustainable pace. So then you have to learn how to have difficult conversations, but also ask the right questions to just better align on if our goal is to do this such that we can be profitable, what are we going to cut out this week or like this quarter or whatever? We can't do everything. Everything can't be a priority. So those are skills I learned at Impact. And they're helpful on this project very much as a consultant. But fortunately, there is someone in between me and the stakeholders that is kind of negotiating that on our behalf, which is great. So it basically allows me to spend more time developing, but I'm given a lot of opportunities to open up stories that I think are important. And we're all kind of given the freedom to know, like, well, this is what we're working on this week, but like it can change. And like the key there is just make sure you, you speak with your team and just say, hey, I know at planning we said this was a priority, but I'm realizing it might need to take a back seat because maybe there's a bunch of errors happening somewhere else in the app, or maybe there's an event happening in a few weeks. And if we do something else to prepare for that event for the product, that could be better for the product as a whole. A lot of communication, basically, it's important. And everyone communicates differently, right? So the project I'm on, we actually just went, we used to have a daily sync, like, you know, video call, but we're experimenting with just doing it completely asynchronous. So just open up Slack, just put in what you're working on. And if you have any blockers, that's the time that you would just huddle with someone. And also throughout the day, if you just need to like virtually tap somebody on the shoulder, obviously go ahead and do that. But we've been experimenting with that. And I, I like it from a productivity standpoint, but I do like miss just the virtual water cooler. So I'm, it's like, how do you find that balance? And I don't have an answer to that right now. You know, that's been like a little bit of a challenge, I guess. But it's been nice being able to just explore different ways to work on a project and not just get stuck and be like, okay, we're going to just do it this way. Yeah. You said that every so often, like people roll in and out of the team you're working on. How do you kind of manage being able to bring someone up to speed quickly? I imagine, like you said, it does take time, but also like, because like you're billing the client, you don't want to waste their time when you rotate people in. How do you do that effectively? Yeah, that's a million dollar question. I think honestly, part of it is the technology we choose. So Rails makes it really easy to roll on and off of a project because you know, kind of know where everything's going to be at a high level. Because that was my experience. Because obviously when I started this job, I'd never worked for ThoughtBot and I certainly hadn't worked for the project that I'm on. And I would just look at a story and I could figure out like, okay, it's, it's in the model. I got to just do something there. Technology makes it easy to roll on and off, at least as for the back end work. We have a wiki, but I'm finding that one of the problems with wikis is to get out of date. They're not in the source code. So that's been a challenge. Actually, what I'm exploring with now is using the Rails notes command, like the annotations command for things that are basically to document the complicated business logic of this app. Because that's been the challenge for this project, but also that's the challenge with any project is just the business logic, not so much like the tech stack necessarily. So I've been trying to do that, especially when I'm given a task where I'm like, basically where I can't keep it all in my head. I'm like, this is so confusing. Like, I don't understand how this external API works the way it does. And then I'm just like, let's just add a comment. I go back and forth with comments. I'm sure like every developer does where when you're first learning the program, you're like, okay, let me add comments, just like sequentially go through this. And then as you start to progress in your career, This is my experience anyways. The pendulum swung the other way and I'm like, oh, no, no, no. No more comments. We're done with those. I'm a cool programmer now. I know what I'm doing. No more comments. And, you know, you try to write code that is like self-documenting. What I'm finding is code can't be self-documenting in a situation where it has to explain the why. You can make a method have a nice name to explain kind of what it's doing to make it a little more clear. Just like, why are you doing this weird thing right here? That's been a challenge with this project is, is there's some, the API we're working with is, it's just hard to work with basically. And there's a lot of unexpected side effects. So I'm just leaning into commenting. I know the original question was onboarding. In general, I'm finding it, it hasn't been too hard to roll on and off, like I said, because of the tech stack. Right. And we thought about, we also have guides that we work with. You know, our thought about guides repo. So just like, it's kind of a framework for how projects should work in general. Like 
use some type of a Trello service to keep track of stories, keep PR small and simple, things like that. So it's a framework for working with different projects. And because everyone kind of understands that it is easier to go on and off. Do new clients, do you know if like they kind of take a week or something to sort of standardize? They have an existing project, get everything sort of organized, like make sure CI is working properly and whatnot. Is that probably a piece of the onboarding stuff as you get a new client so then you can have your team easily jump in, I would guess? That's a good question. I joined this project. It was relatively new when I joined it, but I wasn't there for that like golden moment for like the Rails new command. I missed out on the Rails new. I wish I was there for that. One thing I'm finding though is that, so I should say ThoughtBot is now, we're fully remote. And because of that, we have four distinct units. So there's mission control and they do like, that's like the DevOps team. Then there's Ignite and they do like rapid prototyping just to validate an idea. So like they'll use like Webflow and, and technologies like that just to get something up very quickly. Then there's Liftoff. That's the team I'm on. And that's like where you're building an MVP. So something that's been validated with Ignite and then like Liftoff is actually bringing it to life as a real product. And then there's Boost. And that's where you're kind of like maintaining something that Liftoff has made or like working with a new client who just needs some extra help. So knowing that, depending on which team you're on, it's going to be a different answer. Some projects, it's already an existing application that you're maintaining. Other projects, it's brand new, but they know that at some point they're going to be handed off with this code. And just because we all have our own opinions on our technology, what technology to use and whatnot, you need to account for their hiring needs too. For example, I mean, I just love vanilla rails. Vanilla rails with turbo, I feel like I can do anything. However, a lot of people still want to have React for their front end because it's easier to hire React developers. And it also gives you the opportunity to use something like React Native to build a native application. And these are things that have to go into like each new project is the client you're working with at some point is going to take ownership of this. So you need to take into account those types of things too. The yeah. hiring part makes a lot of sense. It's something I don't consider because I work on products that are just built in Rails. And so that's who we hire are Rails developers. So that's really interesting insight. Arguably, there's a business reason to not use React, but for a hiring standpoint, it does make a lot of sense to have a tool that is widely hireable. Oftentimes, when you're consulting, the team changes probably a fair bit as you get a big new client, you're going to need maybe more developers because everybody you already have is on existing projects, already busy or whatever. Whether US East 1 is down or you forgot to add a configuration file, everyone has an outage from time to time. When your next outage occurs, transparency is critical. The difference between a minor annoyance that people soon forget and a fiasco that creates sustained resentment is in how you communicate. That's why you need Honey Badger. Honey Badger will be a crucial component of your incident response plan with their uptime monitoring service that now has an exciting new feature, public status pages. Create a new status page with custom domains, branding, and more. Don't let Twitter be the only way your users can find out if your app is down. Sign up for Honey Badger to improve your incident response with a shiny new status page that you will be proud to show your users. Visit honeybadger.io and start giving your users a better experience today and let them know Remote Ruby sent you. Thanks to Honey Badger for their continued support of Remote Ruby. I know ThoughtBot has a lot of gems that were built in ThoughtBot. Do you use the, what was it called? Suspenders? Is that still around? Do you like reach for the ThoughtBot gems or is it kind of like, you know, based on what project needs are? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think there's some actually some open issues in the suspenders right now. The sense I'm getting is I don't know if we're using it as much right now for new projects because it comes with a lot of dependencies, which isn't good or bad, but there's a case to be made that you probably don't need every single thing that comes with suspenders as good of a starting point as it is. That being said, I think the project I'm on is the result of suspenders or at least parts of it. But yeah, that's something I haven't experienced yet, which I feel like there is some, some need for exploration there. Especially because, you know, Rail 7 is still relatively new. I still think there's some opportunities to just see like, just straight up doing like Rails new 
and then slowly adding in gems as you need them. Top one, obviously, we're big with R spec, so that's like one deviation right away from the the standard Rails framework. And like we use devise a lot. There's devise, there's also clearance, clearance of the Thoughtbot authentication gem. But suspenders is always there as like a good starting point. I hadn't even thought about suspenders in a while, but I remember that I just looked at it. Yeah, it comes with a lot of things out of the box. So I could see how, like you said, it's not good or bad. It just is. Are all these tools the right thing for your project? So I can see why that's not always yes or not always no. When you were at Impact, on a small team, like, you know, you're building a product, sure. But at the end of the day, it never ends up just building a Rails app. You always, almost always have to get involved in design, project management, talking to stakeholders, blah, blah, blah. You think that really kind of helped set you up for like what you're now doing? Yeah, absolutely. Because I was much more involved with a lot more aspect at Impact because it was their first product. It was very new to them. And like I was one of the first software engineers that they hired. There was no one else. Just by default, I was like the expert. Me and Colin and Morgan, like we were the most knowledgeable people in the entire company on this thing that was brand new, which was interesting, especially because again, it was my first realist job. It touched so many things. Yes, I was in the front end a lot, which that's a weakness of mine. It's hard for me to get a pixel perfect design. And yeah, a lot of managing stakeholders, especially just around like deadlines and expectations, especially because the work that Impact does, they do make websites. So it's not that they don't understand what goes into a website. It's just the challenge was their specialty is like WordPress and HubSpot. So that's just a very different type of website than building something, you know, a SaaS application. Like with HubSpot and WordPress, there's no concept of test-driven development or you don't really build a feature. You just look for a plugin or something. So I just need to kind of make that clear and like in a helpful way, just to let them know, like, it's hard to rush these things because we need to spend time testing them. Like it takes time to write a test. There's, There's a cost to that. But then the benefit, hopefully, you know, it's like, well, it's tested. We know it works. And if it breaks, we'll know about it too. So a lot of my experience there, I felt like it was also just trying to educate stakeholders and how software development works, which is very beneficial for working at ThoughtBox with consultants. So those same rules apply. I would imagine though at ThoughtBot, I've had that argument before, right? Why are y'all spending so much time doing this? We need y'all to do this. And it's always like, come sit down let's have a chat <laughs> um, where I'm going to like explain to them how this works. It's a process of getting to that understanding for them as well. And they have also literally said this to me before. I could do this in like five minutes. Just give me access to the code, man. Then I do. And like, you know, they never do it. So anyway, I would not imagine like if I hired ThoughtBot that I would have to really advocate for things like that. But that sounds like you still are, maybe not that thing specifically, but there's still a bunch of like advocation for like maybe best practices or we're trying to provide them the most maintainable software that you possibly can, even though they are like, but I want this thing now. Yeah, fortunately, I haven't had any real conversations like that in detail, but it's something I always keep in mind where if I'm working on something, I just try to keep their perspective in the back of my head as to like, you know, because they're spending a lot of money on this thing and this is their business. It's not so much that I've had to advocate for the work that we're doing, like if it takes longer or something. Fortunately, that has not been a problem. There's a big level of trust. So if something takes longer, there's a good reason why. So there's a good level of trust. It's more, I want to make sure I'm always doing the best work that I can. And if I do need to speak up about it, like if I think basically, if I think something's going to take longer than it should, I always make sure to bring that up sooner than later, just to keep everyone in the know, which has never been a problem because then people are just grateful for that. They don't want to find out, you know, five minutes before launch. Right. Oh, whoops. Right. Yeah, I think I'm supposed to do it. It's still going to take another two weeks. So <laughs> I was going to try to make you role play this with me, but I'm not because I realized that's going to be way too hard. I'm just kind of curious, like this isn't really even related to this whole thing, but it's like, what if someone's like, look, I understand that writing tests is like good and all, but like you're trying to build maintainable software and like, I appreciate that. But like, look, I don't know if this business is really going to last that much longer. If we don't get this thing done, I need you to just stop doing that and just, just pump the code out. What is your response? This is a good one right here. 
I think it would depend on like how important that feature is. If it's mission critical and we don't test it, I wouldn't feel good about that. And I would bring that up. If it's like a core part of the app and if it's like relatively complicated, I would want some level of coverage. If that's off the table, I don't know. It, it would also depend on the deadline, right? If I was given like right. what I assume to be a reasonable amount of time, I would say I can at least write like the happy path system test for this, at least make sure it works. I would like to be able to do that. If not, I would just, I mean, a big part of consulting is laying out the risks, which is something we do every right. planning meeting. We just say, what are the risks for this week? And sometimes they're small, sometimes they're big. I would just outline the risk. I would say, okay, I mean, we could launch this feature, you know, maybe ahead of schedule. If we don't write tests, the risk is things could break. And if they break, we're going to have to fix them immediately. We're not going to find out it broke until a person finds out that it broke. And, you know, if the customers can't use the application, you're going to lose money. Everyone's wants and needs are different, but most people are motivated by money in those contexts. So I would just say, I think financially, you're probably at risk of losing money if it's like really buggy. And they might say, well, I think we're at risk of losing money if you don't get this out in a week. And I would also have to trust. There's a level of trust, right? Just like they trust me to write good code, I would trust them to know their business model better than me and their financial situation better than me. So that's how I'd line it out. I like how you brought up the motivations thing because when you were speaking earlier, they kind of brought that up to me. It's like, well, you know, your motivations are to write good maintainable code. Their motivations are for you to get this done so they can make money. And I like how you brought it up. Like, yeah, when you're coming to like these types of discussions, you really need to know what the other person's motivations are. I assume a lot of clients also have developers, but maybe some don't. I was curious, are you working with their developers, your own team, working alone a lot? Kind of how all of that works. I'd love to hear about that. It's different for every team and every project, but the short answer is whenever ThoughtBot is working on a project, the client really does become part of ThoughtBot and vice versa for that project. So like I said, you know, between retros and daily syncs, the assumption is everyone is going to be there for that. As far as pair programming goes, so right now we're pair programming in external developers. The project I'm on it just so happens that there are no developers at this company yet. It's so they're just using ThoughtBot. And I've been mostly working independently for the backend stories that I'm working on. So for context, it's a Rails backend and a React Native application. And there's more needs for the React Native application right now. So I'm the only dedicated backend developer. So I do spend most of my time just coding independently, which for the most part I like, but then one thing that our team gets in the habit of is just nudging someone if you need help. Honestly, what we do is we just use Slack huddle. I hadn't used that until ThoughtBot. And it's funny because basically it's just a phone call and I'm so used to video calls that it actually took some getting used to just being on like a traditional phone call, but not seeing someone's face and just like talking about something. It took me like a week to get used to that because it's not really as common anymore. But that's something I've been doing in the past few months is I'll just tap the shoulder of someone on our team that does have backend experience, have a question, I'll just say, hey, let me just like rubber duck this with you real quick. Or if we've had a PR open for like three or four days, that's just kind of getting reviewed over and over again. We'll just sync up and pair on it and just like kind of go through some of the things on there to just kind of wrap up that PR. But yeah, the original question, it's like the same team when you're working with the client, but it's not like we don't pair like all day. It's mostly independent, but then when you need to pair up, absolutely, that, that's um, what you're encouraged to do. Before we wrap up, one thing I wanted to call out that I didn't get a chance to earlier was that when you were talking about kind of onboarding and you said that you leave notes using the Rails note tool or whatever, I'm familiar with it, I've never used it. A, I think that's awesome. But you said something about comments and I think it was like really important and I'd never been able to really articulate it. You said that you kind of went through a phase where you're like, no comments. And then you're like, it's actually really important to comment why it does something, not what it's doing. And I think that is really important differentiator that when commenting code, I really, I guess I implicitly do now, but I did not understand when I first started commenting code. I would just be like, oh, this is what it does. And that goes back to like, in Ruby, we often talk about you shouldn't comment because you should be able to look at the code and understand what it does. And that is true. The why, though, is so important because like when we onboard people at Podia, they understand what something's doing, but their question is always, why does it do this? 
I thought that was really good. I just wanted to highlight that. Yeah, thank you. And it's also, it's one to help future people onboarding, but then it also helped future me out. Because honestly, like the thing that I commented, I had been told probably four times and obviously I forgot. So <laughs> shame on me. So then I was just like, I'm just going to put a comment in here because then I won't forget and need to build the next person. As we're getting close to Jason's cutoff, I'm going to yank control of the train real quick. I said this last time, but like you have a fire Twitter. Congratulations. You survived my purge. I'll send you your plaque. I'm curious what you're kind of interested in now. What are things you're kind of keeping an eye on? Is there any new gems or anything in the Rails Ruby ecosystem? You're like, oh, that's really cool. I'm going to try that. Basically, what's next after building your own auth from scratch? If that's even done. There's some open issues on there. If anyone wants to help out, <laughs> can always use some help on that. This may not come as a surprise because the auth from scratch, the whole point of that was to not use a gem. I'm interested in exploring other things from scratch. And the next one specifically is I want to do token-based off from scratch and just go through that step-by-step. Step. Because I think Rails gives you all the tools for that. It's just a matter of knowing how to sequentially build them up. And even though earlier in the beginning of this, I said I'm not doing React. I'm much more interested in Rails, like Rails and Turbo. That being said, I see some of the people on my team be able to work on React Native, like work on the native application that we're building and then hop into the back end. And I think that's really empowering just because basically this person could just make their own business if they wanted to. They have all the tools they need. And I think that's so neat. I want to explore some more concepts of React 2 with Rails because Rails has an API mode only. So I think that would be a good way to explore those things like the token-based authentication, for example, or just other things like fetching data from an endpoint and like iterating over it. I know it's been done a million times, but I honestly struggle with it when it's in pure JavaScript. So I'd like to kind of put pen to paper, so to speak, and just like spin up a few demos of how that's done. If nothing else, because then it'll be part of my muscle memory and I'll learn how to do it. So, and then it'll be a resource for folks to check out and also open issues on too, because I know I'm not going to get it right the first time, which is why I tweet these things out because... It's a very quick way to get advice. I feel like some of this content would be like really great to like put it into a course, show people how you kind of went about doing it. And so I feel like not only is the finished kind of thing helpful, but I think the process of building these types of things is something that people don't know how to do. And that's something that they want to learn. And it's really hard to learn that. So I happen to know a company that has like platform basically like you could actually put it <laughs> on it so if you want that just let me know but point aside i do think that is interesting like because as you're speaking i'm like how would i do that I'm like, i don't know i would like love to just hear how steve thinks about it maybe some food for thought also no one writes react anymore now we're on the remix so <laughs> okay <laughs> well steve it's been fun catching up two weeks good to see you two weeks in a row before we wrap anything else you want to discuss or share? Uh, yeah, well, thanks again for having me. I never left the original Zoom call from two weeks ago. <laughs> I've been sitting here for two weeks. I figured at some point they would pop back on and I could just be a guest again. So it worked out. He's squatting in our office. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or my site if you just have any questions on Rails or web development or just how to get a job in tech if you don't have any traditional schooling. Like I said, I, I didn't go to school directly for, for this. So I just kind of know how to kind of make a resume organically for the side projects. So feel free to reach yeah, out. I need to talk to you about that at some point because I give a lot of advice on that, but that's not the path I took. Now that you've said that, <laughs> I want to tell you what I've been telling people and see if like I'm just way off base or not. So I'll have to hit you up at some point soon. Cool. Awesome. Steve, thank you. Cool. Yeah, Great thank you for coming back on. If you stay on the Zoom, you'll be on our next episode too, I think. <laughs> going <for five. laughs> just pulling out a substantial lead here. <laughs> He's just going to end up being the host. We'll all leave. He'll still be here. Well, here's what I propose. Basically, we're going to swap, right? Aaron Francis needs to be with y'all and I need to be on a Rails podcast. So like, y'all can talk Laravel here. I'll go over <laughs> there and see if you can just come with me. It'll be a party. We should have Aaron on. I'll send yeah, we should. Right now. Please join us right now. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> no, I mean, like, sorry, I'll send him the, the schedule right now, not the Zoom link. Okay, yeah, bye. Here. Bye. Bye. <laughs>